I have a very special guest joining me now. It's uh, Scott Ritter, none other than Scott Ritter. He's a former United Nations weapons inspector. He's former Marine Corps intelligence author, analyst. He does everything, and I think he's the person to talk to uh, uh, about this. So, uh, Scott, thank you for joining us. How are you? Doing fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Thanks for coming on such short notice. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like there's a war breaking out or anything. <laughs> I mean, it, it isn't a laughing matter, though. Uh, uh, this is very serious. And I, I just wanted to get your initial reaction on uh, this, this limited operation or special operation that Putin called it in, in Ukraine's Donbass region. Well, first of all, there's nothing limited about this. This is an all-out invasion of Ukraine. Um, we, we've already have reports of, uh, you know, Russian troops taking the city of Mariupol, it's supposed to be the hardest fought. That's where the Azov battalion is. Mm -hmm. Less than an hour, the city fell. Uh, Russian troops have landed in Odessa. Russia tanks are pouring out of uh, Crimea uh, and pouring down towards Kharkov. And uh, it, it's it's all over. I mean, this, this, this is a massive operation and uh, the Ukrainian military is uh, not up to the task. Uh, Right now, I feel I feel bad for these guys because they've been led uh, to believe that they can fight the Russians. Uh, we they've had NATO trainers there. They've received, um, you know, so-called lethal uh, weapons. <laughs> Those lethal weapons mm. were in warehouses. Those warehouses are destroyed right now. I've just watched the explosions. They're gone. Um, any any Ukrainian who tries to use a javelin missile will be dead the second they try to use it. Uh, but they can't communicate. They can't move. They can't do anything. All they can do is surrender or die. Um, you know, th that's that's the reality of it. This this is an operation that will demilitarize Ukraine. Well, um, now, you ahead. know, Putin, uh, uh, in his announcement, he said that it's limited. And he said it's just in the Donbass region. You said it's not limited. Uh, I, I I was just about to show clips of uh, explosions in in uh, uh, Kiev or, or Kiev, however it's pronounced. I I <laughs> I mean, you pronounce Kiev from now on. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, they they differ in from Russian to to Ukrainian, right? So so he's been saying it's limited. You're saying it's not. Uh, I mean, what, what, who are we supposed to believe here? Because the the Western media, I mean, they 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 said he's going to invade for for a long time now, right? And uh, even when he sent the so-called peacekeepers uh, the other day, they called that an invasion as well. The White House called it an invasion. So it was was the invasion two days ago, or is it today, or is it both? Look, I, I just, you know, I let the facts speak for themselves. Um, it, you're going to see paratroopers in Kiev. You're going to see, they already have paratroopers in Odessa. Uh, naval infantry has taken Mariupol and the tanks are pouring in. Um, that's, call it what you want. Uh, that, that's just what it is. That's the reality. Um, he said it was a limited operation for Donbass, but he also said that they're going to demilitarize and denazify uh, Ukraine. That means right. two things. One, the Ukrainian military will cease to exist. There will be no Ukrainian military when this is finished. And two, the Ukrainian government's gone because it's a Nazi regime. Not because I say so, but because President Putin has labeled it as such. And, you know, this is a Russian operation. Um, we in the West can sit back there and uh, shake our heads, wag our fingers. It doesn't matter. The reality is made by Russia. And that reality is transpiring on the ground right now. Afterwards, you know, we can dissect it and criticize it, et cetera. But, you know, right now, I just let the facts speak for themselves. And the facts are Russia is overrunning Ukraine as we speak. Right. I mean, he, he said that exact uh, those those uh, exact words that he wants to denazify Ukraine. He said something along the lines of your ancestors fought the Nazis. Uh, uh, how, how you know, how dare you? Uh, collaborate with them now or, or become neo-Nazis. I, do, I don't I didn't get the exact translation. We haven't had a proper one yet. But um, yeah, so what does he mean by that? It, it's 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 not just the Azov battalion. It's beyond that. It's the entire Ukrainian military, as you said. Is that is that what's being labeled Nazi now? You know, I don't want to again, I don't want to denigrate the entire Ukrainian military. Um, I'm, I'm sure that it's staffed by professional officers and soldiers who um, who believe in the defense of Ukraine, but they've allowed themselves to be infiltrated by a radical right-wing nationalistic element whose loyalties are to, um, you know, a, a Ukrainian uh, nationalist named Bandera, who uh, fought on the side of the Nazis during World War II. Yep. Um, they've torn down uh, memorials to, you know, the Soviet liberators, 
uh, from World War II. And instead, they've put up monuments celebrating Ukrainians who fought for the 12th SS Panzer Division. SS Panzer Division. Yep. You know, I, I mean, it doesn't get any more Nazi than that. And so, you know, there's there's two categories of Nazis in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Those are there are those who are actual Nazis, and there's thousands of them. Uh, and there's those who tolerate it, who are facilitators of this radical right wing hateful ideology. And, you know, we in the West can sit here and and and, and go, well, you know, come on, don't overreact. It's, it's not that big of a deal. For the Russians, it's a huge deal. Um, you know, 30 million dead is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, this resonates with the Russian psyche in a way that no one in the West will understand or comprehend. So while there's a temptation in the West to say, now, this is just Putin exaggerating. This is Putin making a mountain out of a molehill. No, it's not. It needs to be taken seriously. It should have been taken seriously. I think there's a lot of people waking up right now understanding that maybe we should have listened more carefully to what the Russian president was saying. And had we listened and taken action, um, this war could have been prevented. But now it's too late. The war's on, and Ukraine, as we know it, is never going to exist again. Well, I mean, I, I, that, that SS division that you were mentioning, I, I, I know of it because they massacred a village in France, right? Oradour, a very, very uh, powerful uh, uh, um, a poem. And of course, you know, my grandfather fought in World War II, RAF. So that's always resonated with me. And, and the Russians lost much more than we did, um, you know, uh, Brit Brits and Americans. So I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's a much more potent uh, uh, thing for them. But uh, when you say that it, this is all because, you know, the West hasn't listened to Russia's demands or Russia's concerns. Uh, the big elephant in the room here is NATO expansion, right? Do yep. you think, I'm just going to ask you very you know, straight up, very clearly, do you think that this could have been avoided if, um, you know, Ukraine had come out and said, we're not going to join NATO, or the West had said, we're not going to accept Ukraine, and that's final? Yes, the, 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 this war would not be happening if that had happened. Uh, there would, you see, that creates room for a diplomatic settlement. Because there's still a lot of problems between Russia and the West. But the big one, the one that was an existential threat to Russia, was uh, Ukraine becoming a NATO member. Now, people are going to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, even though they, they, you know, the open door policy, uh, Ukraine wasn't going to become a member for 10 years. That's what Germany was saying. This isn't going to happen for at least 10 years. So why the urgency? You mm -hmm. know, there's membership and then there's de facto membership. OK, right now, what was happening in Ukraine was that NATO was pouring in billions of dollars of weaponry. They were sending in hundreds and thousands of trainers who were training Ukrainian military to become a de facto proxy of NATO. I mean, Ukraine had already been a proxy of NATO. They deployed troops to uh, Iraq. They deployed troops to Afghanistan. Uh, they were training to NATO standards. Um, you know, right. it, it, this, you know, so from a Russian perspective, it doesn't matter if you're a NATO member, you're acting as if you were a NATO member. And therefore, Russia said, stop, cease and desist. We don't tolerate it. And they made it a red line. Now, in the United States, we've become accustomed to presidents drawing red lines and then ignoring them. Well, Putin drew a red line. There's no ignoring this. He's acting on it. Um, and, and like I said, it's time for the West to, to wake up. It doesn't yeah. mean we surrender. I mean, the last thing anybody should do right now is say we're going to give everything Russia everything they want, uh, because that's not how you react after something of this magnitude. Uh, you don't, uh, you know, let the tiger think he can eat everybody yeah. in the room. Uh, but you don't want to go to war either. Um, you know, there, there there needs to be the West needs to establish some serious red lines like the Polish border, the Romanian border, the Baltic states, and be prepared to defend them with force if necessary. And, you know, the West is having a major wake up call because NATO has allowed its military capability to uh, to to rock for the last 20 years. The United States has been you know, I, uh, killing right. goat herders and kicking down doors in the Iraq. Uh, we can't fight the war that, that that's being trans, you know, that's taking place right now. What the Russians are doing is just stunning. The Russians are unleashing the kind of hell that um, a modern combined arms military is capable of doing. NATO's got nothing that can stand up to this right now. And this is a wake up call to NATO. If you want to take on Russia, OK, but put on your big boy pants, put the dollars down and rebuild your military. Otherwise, 
it might be time for you to think about maybe we need to listen to what Russia is saying, because Russia doesn't want to take over Europe. This isn't the Soviet Union. They're not driving to the Rhine. They do want NATO, however, to withdraw to their pre-1997 borders, uh, at least the military. They're not saying that Poland and the Baltic states can't be NATO members. What they're saying is no German forces, no American forces, no British forces, no non-Polish or Baltic state NATO forces can right. be in those states. Pull them back. But get rid of the anti-ballistic missile, uh, so-called anti-ballistic missile capability in Poland and Romania. Um, and you know, before everybody was just yawning, oh, that's just the Russians overreaching. Um, I don't think anybody's yawning anymore. Putin has always said to people, you don't listen to me when I speak. And he had a famous speech where he showed the, the Russian nuclear capabilities. He said, are you listening to me now? Well, guess what? Putin sent in a giant wake up call saying, are you listening to me now? And hopefully the West is listening. I mean, you 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 said you made an interesting point, though. I, I've I've seen you saying that NATO is not ready. They just don't have the same capability, and they haven't been training for the same things the Russians have. Uh, you you said though that the West. I think this this goes to the crux of the issue that Putin was talking about, because uh, you said that the West must define the borders in Eastern Europe. I mean, Putin is saying that people in Eastern Europe and Russia should define their own borders. He was talking about how you know Ukraine was basically Russia, um, and that uh, uh, it was created by Russia, and 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 they're united and such. And he he doesn't seem to um, to to think the same. He doesn't want the West uh, uh, defining. Uh, Europe's borders, right? I'm, I mean, he doesn't say- want the West defining Slavic borders. Um, he he rejected, uh, for instance, the effort by the European Union to dictate the outcome of the August 2020 election in Belarus. Uh, yeah. He opposed efforts by uh, by NATO and in, in the EU to support Belarusian opposition figures. And what we've seen now is that he is permanently transferred the First Guard's tank army to Belarusian soil. Um, so he's guaranteeing that uh, Belarus will be a Slavic state aligned with Moscow. And he's doing the same thing with Ukraine right now. He is eliminating, terminating all pro-Western um, structures. Um, I mean, if you're if you're NATO one of these, or otherwise, yeah. Uh, so, uh, he's the Nazis. Um, all those uh, hard, you know, nationalistic elements that uh, operate out of Lvov—they're gone. They'll be—they'll either die, be arrested, or they're going to flee to Poland. Uh, I think we're going to see a large expatriate population residing in Poland for uh, for the next hundred years because they're not coming back to Ukraine. It's over. Um, I, I don't know how to be more definitive than that. The 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 reality of Ukraine as we knew it, and I've warned about this all along. I said if Ukraine doesn't understand what's about to happen to it, it's going to cease to exist as a modern nation state as it's currently configured. And that's true. Um, It's done. And so, you know, Russia is defining the Slavic borders. And we may see some action with uh, the Transnistria region in Moldova, um, now that Russia is going to expand to uh, (laughs) into Ukraine, uh, there are some uh, I think there's some shared borders there, and, and that may become part of the greater Slavic uh, family as well. Um, but Russia is not going to dictate, for instance, the uh, the eastern border of Poland or the. Uh, well, we got to be careful here with the Baltics, and this is why NATO needs to uh, grow a spine right now because there are some large Russian-speaking populations in the Baltic states that are being oppressed by the uh, Estonians, the Latvians, the Lithuanians. And um, you know, Russia may feel emboldened by what's happening right now and seek to flex its muscle up north. That gets a little bit more dangerous and tricky. And uh, it's important for the West, uh, for NATO, not to show too much weakness, because right now they're just impotent. I mean, this is, this is pathetic. This is truly pathetic. And I'm glad, because I don't want a war between NATO and Russia. But you know the fact of the matter here's we we've got this transatlantic alliance that's been walking around as if they're the the big band on the block and we find out really they're just they're just pathetic they're they're well, overweight little pudgy bully in the in the in the in the in, 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 in you know in the recess yard who um is finding out that just about anybody can kick his butt well i mean I, I was talking about this before that the soviet union doesn't exist anymore so i mean nato's original purpose 
uh, stated or otherwise is is kind of defunct now. But uh, just getting back to to what's happening, I mean, what's unfolding right now as we're, we're speaking in Ukraine, you, you were saying that it is an invasion. Uh, you know, the Russian military is saying that they're only doing targeted strikes. And I mean, who, who's, who are we to believe now? Because if we look at what the U.S. did, for example, in Syria in 2018, no one was calling that an invasion. Uh, obviously, it was to a much smaller scale. But I mean, the, the initial reaction wasn't to say immediately it's an invasion. Uh, there are many other things, drone strikes, uh, uh, other so-called precision strikes that, that have uh, gone on in Pakistan, for example. No one ever said that the U.S. invaded Pakistan. Can we say that what's happening right now in Ukraine from the Russians is really an invasion or it's just going to be limited strikes and then, uh, you know, they're going to keep uh, their peacekeepers or whatever they're calling them uh, in the Donbass? What, what do you think? Um, it doesn't matter what I think. It's what the facts are. And, 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 and the facts are unfolding as we speak, meaning that um, I don't know. Um, nobody knows. We'll know sometime tomorrow. I mean, if if the 76th Airborne Division lands in Kiev uh, at the airport and uh, drives its uh, vehicles into into Kiev proper to seize the uh, the government facilities, um, that's an invasion. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> uh, if if uh, <laughs> Russian naval infantry are uh, disembarking in Odessa, as rumors have it, that's an invasion. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll find out soon enough. Uh, yeah. You know, right now, it's the fog of war. We, we simply just don't know. The, the thing I wanted to ask you about is uh, the, the point of contention in international law, because the Russians are saying that uh, they're, they're recognizing LPR and DPR uh, under the, the right to self-determination. They, they're using that argument uh, under international law. And then the West and NATO are saying that Russia is violating uh, uh, Article 2, Paragraph 4, uh, you know, territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, how do you reconcile these two? You know, who, who's right in this case? Well, you know, this is where international lawyers come in. I mean, we saw the same kind of, um, you know, ridiculous discussion going on when the United States went into Iraq, you know, as to whether it was an invasion or it was, uh, you know, a necessary operation to get rid of weapons of mass destruction. So it was an invasion. It was an invasion. End of story. Um, you know, the Russians, of course, can't come right out and say we're violating international law. No nation's going to say that. Right. So they're going to develop a, um, a, a, a line of you know, legalistic argumentation uh, that uh, paints what they're doing uh, differently. Um, and you know, it, it, they should be able to do it. I mean, look, look Putin's already said that the uh, government that's in, in Kiev is an, is an illegitimate government. Uh, it came into power from a coup. Uh, you know, he's used some very crafty language when referring mm -hmm. to them, uh, not as an official government, but as those who came into power from an illegal coup, et cetera. So um, by, by doing that, you eliminate legitimacy on the part of the Ukrainian government. Um, and so what you have instead is a Nazi regime, an illegal regime, of, and maybe an ex through an extension, expansion of peacekeeping, it's necessary to eliminate that. You know, I'll let the Russian diplomats and lawyers um, twist this any way they want to. Um, but I, I, you know, I think if we're going to condemn the United States for violating international law through the invasion of Ukraine or uh, of, of Iraq, uh, we have to be consistent. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that Russia is evil. Doesn't mean anything. It just means that international law um, it, it doesn't know how to deal with uh, an institution like NATO. I mean, NATO hmm. exists outside the framework of the United Nations Charter. NATO exists outside the framework of international law. Where were all these people who were concerned about international law when NATO created the nation state of Kosovo, stripping it away from the Serbian nation uh, because just because some Albanian Kosovar said, we want to be independent. Well, Russia took that, you know, and Putin at the time said, you guys are making a horrible mistake. This is going to come back and bite you. Well, it just did because Russia used the exact same playbook yeah. to create Lugansk and, uh, and, and Donetsk, the exact same playbook. So no one in the West can literally have any credibility. And then where was the world when the United States invaded Iraq? Where was the world? Where was the condemnation? Where was the angst and the anxiety? Russia just took the same playbook and they're doing it better. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that Russia is operating uh, in, in, in total conformity with international law. They're not. What I am going to say is that international law, as it's currently configured, um, is, is not up to the task of dealing with the situation. Because if Russia were to abide strictly by international law, 
then NATO would get away with everything that Russia says represents an existential threat to their existence. And, you know, Putin is saying, uh, he, he's saying that our objective is not to occupy Ukraine. Do you, do you believe that he's right? Uh, what about the Minsk agreements? What, what, what of the Minsk agreements? Are they, those even relevant anymore? Well, Minsk is no longer relevant. I mean, the Ukrainians had seven years to save their, their, their country. Um, they opted out, uh, partly because the United States, Germany, France, um, Great Britain, uh, didn't put enough pressure on them. And, and indeed, in the end, took the Ukrainian side saying that, well, Minsk is unfair. Um, well, then you shouldn't have signed it. But, you know, the bottom line is you needed to implement Minsk. It's, it, all, it was only too late. I mean, you know, you know watching uh, Tony Blinken speak before the uh, United Nations Security Council, and, you know, we are pushing the Ukrainians to implement Minsk. Well, the Ukrainians turned around and said, we're not going to do it. Okay, you made your bed. Now you got to sleep in it. That means that you don't exist anymore. Uh, Minsk is gone. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be a new uh, Minsk afterwards. I mean, when this is all said and done, I do believe that the Russians don't want to occupy Ukraine. That would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing the Russians want to do is create um, the legitimacy for a for a for an insurgency. Uh, they're going to terminate this government. They're going to demilitarize Ukraine, and then they're going to put in place a new government that will create a new military that is more along the lines of the Belarusian military, meaning that it will uh, cooperate with the um, with with the. Um, you know, the, the, the Russian military, et cetera. But, the, you know, Russian troops will secure the Ukrainian border for a while, but they're not going to occupy Ukraine. Um, I, I, I believe that because that's not in, in uh, Putin's interest. But uh, Ukraine is not going to exist like it currently exists. You know, that Ukrainian ambassador to the UN uh, raising uh, hell and havoc right now, he's gone. Right. He, he represents a dead government. Um, that government's gone. Uh, there will be a new government, a new constitution, a new uh, conception of what Ukraine is. And what Ukraine will be is part of this. Uh, uh, it'll be a Slavic rump state that is uh, subordinated to the will of Moscow, much like Belarus is. Well, what do you think is going to happen next? Uh, I, I know this is pure speculation, but just given, you know, the situation that NATO is in, the, the state that it's in, um, it is. We, we do have still five countries surrounding Russia, uh, five NATO countries. Um, you know, someone might ask, what's the point of just going after Ukraine? You are, you're already surrounded. You know, it's too late. Um, do you think that Putin is just trying to create leverage uh, in order to, to get NATO, uh, not just to force where Ukraine, but to, as we mentioned, to not deploy NATO troops in the uh, neighboring countries. Do you think that that's the, the goal here is that I'm going to take control of this uh, 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 border area now until you back off? The goal is set forth in two draft treaties that Russia provided the United States and NATO back in December. That's the goal. Yeah. I mean, there's no secret here. There's no mystery. There's no, you know, what is Putin thinking? It's not. First <laughs> of all, let's stop talking about what Putin's thinking. It's about what Russia's thinking and Russian national security interests require that Ukraine cannot be a member of NATO. Now, Ukraine had an opportunity to become a neutral state. Um, they opted out of that opportunity. Now they're going to become a pro-Russian rump state. Um, but they're never going to be part of NATO. Uh, and that is the new reality. The other reality, I think there's going to be two realities that emerge from this. One, I, I think that this military operation is going to be over in less than a week. Um, I think it's going to be really? one of the most decisive military victories in the history of modern warfare. Um, well, why do you think that? An, because the Ukrainian army can't fight and the Russian army is vastly superior. The Russians have a plan. They're acting on it. And uh, it's unfolding at lightning speed. Um, you know, so I, I just this is going to be over in less than a week. That's my opinion. Now, you can call me back in a week when uh, the Russian army is bogged down outside of Dnepropetrovsk and the Ukrainians have launched valiant counterattacks surrounding the 20th Combined Arms Army, taking thousands of Russian prisoners. OK, then I'll eat my tie. <laughs> but um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, you know, right now, I, uh, you know, as I've said, the, the Ukrainian military can't talk. They're, they're, all their communications are jammed. All their command posts have been destroyed. Um, the, the soldiers are cold, alone in the field. Uh, and surrounded. And they're either going to die or they're going to surrender. That's what's happening right now. We're either seeing a lot of dead Ukrainian soldiers 
or a lot of surrendering. And I'm betting you a dime to a dollar that Russia is going to process far more prisoners of war than they're processing yeah. dead Ukrainians. It's over. Um, and because this is going to be such a decisive one-sided battle, NATO is going to wake up to the fact that you know, we can't talk about military confrontation with Russia. We can talk about defending ourselves, but we need to recognize that in order to challenge Russia, we will have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars that we don't have. We don't have NATO isn't is stop spending money on defense. Um, and the other thing they're going to realize while this debate about rebuilding their military capability is unfolding, um, these sanctions are going to be kicking in. And you know, some of these sanctions are going to target right. you know Russian gas. If they shut off the SWIFT uh, banking system, uh, as soon as they shut off SWIFT, Russia uh, shuts off I gas mean, and oil. That, that's something and I wanted to ask you about. It's over for Europe at that point. I, I wanted to ask Europe. you, yeah. what do you think the military response, but also the, the uh, uh, they like to call it non-military, the sanctions, you know, w what is the response yeah. going to be now from uh, from the Biden administration, from NATO, uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the West in general, um, they, they certainly uh, are not going to start uh, sending U.S. troops there, are they? they no, you know. uh, no, the, 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 I mean, you hear some ridiculous talk about... Um, you know, from the Ukrainian ambassador about uh, NATO invoking Article Four, and uh, you know, and, and he wants NATO to come to the rescue, even though they, they don't get Article Five protection. Um, you know, the collective defense Article Four, they can deploy NATO troops uh, to protect a, a friend and ally. Just not going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. NATO is 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 going to realize that to rebuild their military is going to take a lot of time and a lot of money. While they're having that discussion, though, they're going to be implementing additional sanctions. There's no doubt in my mind that tomorrow we're going to see, or today, we're going to see a, 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 a tremendous number of very serious sanctions being uh, imposed. Um, and given the gravity of the situation and the decisiveness of the Russian action, I think we're going to, you know, the, the, the SWIFT, shutting down SWIFT may be um, on the table. It's a suicide pill, though. If you shut down SWIFT, um, the, you, you're going to collapse uh, the global energy security. Uh, the, the oil prices are going to go through the roof. Uh, energy prices are going to go through, and Europe's going to shut down. Their economy will collapse. Um, I, I think you're in Vienna, Austria, right? You see the UN behind me. Yeah, yeah, ninety percent of uh, of Austria's energy comes from Russia. It does. Good luck. <laughs> I, I, you're, you're gonna, you're, your power plants are going to shut down, and uh, you're going to be living in the dark. It's going to be the cold ages. Yeah. Uh, Germany's going to freeze. Uh, the winter ain't over. Um, you know, and and then it's not just that. You know, people say, well, it's only forty percent. Well, I mean, you take away forty percent of capacity in a in a Western-oriented economy where everything operates on a razor-thin edge of efficiency. There is no fat in the West. You they produce things, they bring it to market, and they put it on the shelves, and it's sold, and then they produce it again. If, if that system gets disrupted, um, supply chains break down and, uh, and nothing works. Um, nothing's going to work in Europe very soon if they implement these sanctions. And Russia has been preparing for this for years. They've lowered their debt. They've built up their, their uh, you know, reserves. Um, they, they have gold reserves, foreign, foreign reserves. Their, their sovereign fund is uh, vibrant. Um, and they've they've started working with other nations uh, to have economic uh, relations that bypass SWIFT. So it's just the West that's committing suicide by doing this. And so it, I, I think Russia will be able to wait out the sanctions. And um, you know the interesting thing about Europe is um, <laughs> there's all these uh, democratically elected officials right now who are destroying the economic well-being of their constituents. James Carville, a famous uh, Democratic uh, presidential consultant, uh, said in, when Bill Clinton was originally running for president, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> that's, all, all, that's all a politician needs to worry about. It's the economy. You have a good economy, you get reelected. You have a bad economy, you're out of office. Well, all of these democratically elected officials who have opted to go down the path of sanctions are going to be voted out of office because they're destroying the economic well-being of their constituents and their constituents are not going to be happy. This was a war that could have been avoided had the West not been stupid and stubborn and 
uh, inconsiderate of legitimate Russian concerns. It's not me being pro-Putin, pro-Russian. One only has to refer to the 2009 memorandum written by William Burns, then the U.S. ambassador to Moscow, today the CIA director. Um, he wrote a memorandum after uh, the, the, the 2008 uh, Bucharest summit where NATO invited Ukraine and Georgia to become members. And he wrote it, it said, net means net, meaning no means no. Uh, the Russians said, no, this is a red line. And he said, this mm -hmm. is serious. The Russians are dead serious about this. And it's a legitimate concern. That was the other thing he said. You know, we, we should not give this short shrift. We should pay attention to this because this is a red line, which if we ignore, will come back to haunt us. He said that in 2009. People should have listened to him because had we listened to him, we wouldn't be in the situation today. Uh, we wouldn't have sought to invite, you know, people have to feel, feel sorry for Ukraine and Georgia. They've been dangled the false promise of NATO membership. They will never be NATO members, ever. They don't qualify, and Russia will never let it happen. And so NATO, instead of recognizing reality, speaks of an open-door policy. There is no open-door policy. Read Article 10 of the, of, of the, of the, of the NATO Charter. Article 10 says that if a nation in Europe qualifies for membership and applies for membership, then NATO will consider it only if inclusion improves the security of right. the NATO mm -hmm. alliance. There's not a single person who can articulate how Ukraine and Georgia's membership in NATO improves NATO's alliance, especially when Russia has said, if you do this, it'll put us in conflict with you. So... This is just a falsehood that's been propagated by, uh, you know, the Secretary General of NATO, by Tony Blinken, by Biden, and by others. There is no open door policy. It doesn't exist. It's a fiction. Um, had NATO simply done what its charter tells it to do, they would have reflected on the fact that neither Ukraine nor Georgia improves their security posture. Therefore, they will be pre precluded from membership, even if they resolved, for instance, their internal. Um, you know, a territorial problems, which exclude them from consideration um, right off the bat. I mean, as long as Russia's in Crimea, theoretically, Ukraine could never be a member because the second Ukraine becomes a member and they seek to resolve their territorial conflict, Article 5 kicks in, NATO finds itself at war. This is why neither Georgia nor Ukraine uh, improve the security posture of uh, of NATO. This It's just a false premise. And Ukraine has been sacrificed on this on this hill. I mean, it's it's sad. It's very sad. Yeah, it's yeah. certainly been used as a pawn. Uh, you, you could argue, and <laughs> that's kind of putting it mildly. Uh, just as a last question, Scott, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, what do you think of the way the you know the the that way that NATO has been you know interacting with the world? Because honestly, if you look at the most recent accomplishments, it's provoking a, a, a Russian incursion, invasion, whatever you want to call it, into Ukraine. We'll see in the morning, uh, you know, destroying Libya, uh, Syria. A lot of people think NATO should be abolished at this point because the Soviet Union doesn't exist. It doesn't serve any purpose. Do you agree with that view? A hundred percent. I mean, NATO lost its uh, reason to exist when the uh, when the Cold War ended, when the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, when the Warsaw Pact uh, disintegrated, there was no reason to have NATO. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, reason for, for existing had disappeared. But instead of recognizing this and doing the right thing, uh, and abiding, for instance, by the promise they gave to Gorbachev, um, you know, the, then the, the, the Soviet president, that, um, you know, Gorbachev said, you know, I, guys, never forget, I got 400,000 troops in East Germany, and I can stop German unification on a dime. Uh, if you want to go down that route. But I'm in favor of stability, so I'll go along with German unification. I'll withdraw my troops, but if I do so, you have to agree not only not to bring NATO troops into the eastern portion of uh, of Germany, but you can't bring NATO troops east of the Elbe. You can't mm -hmm. go into Poland. You can't do do this. And, uh, and he was given assurances, and everybody said, well, it's just verbal. We now found out it's in writing, um, that this wouldn't happen. Um, so you know, right off the bat, we have a, an expansive NATO. Now, NATO says, that's okay. You don't be worried about an expansive NATO because we're a defensive alliance. Really? Then why did they bomb Belgrade in 1999? There was nothing defensive about that. That was offensive military action against a Slavic state. Why did they 
Why, why did NATO send a training mission to Iraq in 2004? Why did NATO members participate in the illegal invasion of Iraq in 2003? Um, you know, they say, well, it's just a training mission. No, it's a training mission in an occupied state that was occupied, uh, you know, from an illegal war of aggression. So you're facilitating, you're legitimizing an illegal war of aggression. That's what NATO did. Why did NATO go into Afghanistan? What business is Afghanistan of NATO's? None. Zero. Um, you know, and, and what did NATO do to Libya? You know, offensive, aggressive military operations. But it's not just these examples. It's a transatlantic organization. Why then did they start a, a partnership in, in, in North Africa where they were seeking to expand their sphere of influence? There's a word we're not allowed to use. In the North Africa. Why did they set up offices in, um, in the United Arab Emirates to create a sphere of influence in the Persian Gulf. Why are they talking about a North Atlantic treaty organization operating in the Pacific to create a sphere of influence to counter China? They're not a defensive organization. It's an offensive-minded, expansive organization with a proven history of carrying out regime change operations in countries they view as a threat. Who is the number one threat to NATO today, per NATO's own words? Russia. So, you know, NATO not only has no reason to exist, NATO is a suicide pill for Europe. And it's high time Europe recognizes that. And I think one of the byproducts of, of this current crisis, this debacle, this tragedy, whatever you want to call it in Ukraine, because there's nothing good about it. I mean, I'm happy the Nazis are, are being kicked out and, and that, but there's nothing good about what's happening. This is a human tragedy of a, you know, of, 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 of a horrendous scale. Um, but the one thing that com can come out of this is maybe Europe will wake up that there is no legitimate reason to continue the NATO alliance and that maybe people like Macron can start putting forward this concept of a new European security framework that respects Russia's spheres of influence. Well, uh, Scott, you put it very meticulously. Uh, thank you for coming on the program on such short notice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Scott Ritter, former UN weapons inspector, former Marine Corps intelligence officer, author, analyst. And uh, I will put your uh, Twitter up in, on in a second and uh, so people can go follow your work online. Thanks so much, Scott. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, guys, so we'll, we'll be continuing the program. Uh, I'll take it from here. Again, that was Scott Ritter. I'm going to put up his uh, social media so you can uh, go follow him. He's really great. Uh, he, you need to understand something, like how important his work is. When the U.S. was trying to invade Iraq in 2002, 2003, and they were seeing Iraq as weapons of mass destruction, the, the reason we know that Iraq didn't have them anymore is because he, he was inspecting the, he was inspecting Iraq. Scott Ritter, who, who I was just talking to, right? So he was the UN weapons inspector uh, in charge of, of uh, making sure that Iraq had uh, disarmed. And then Colin Powell goes to the UN and lies, of course, and says Iraq has failed to disarm. Complete, complete uh, uh, nonsense. I'm, I'm just going to, again, I'm going to put up his social media. Uh, and there, I did an interview with him on this channel about um, Iran uh you know and iran's nuclear uh program and all of this stuff the nuclear deal because he know he knows his stuff about wmds he knows a thing or two right so um i'll of course continue about uh about uh ukraine in a second right i'm just pulling this up for you so you can see that there you go make sure you follow him he's great